Coming up, disorder in the House of Homeland Security. We'll tell you what it means to you. What's happening to that AOPA EA third class medical petition? A cool new twin that just sips fuel. And a no fuel helicopter, if you don't count carbs, that is. AOPA Live this week begins in just a moment. may be about to get worse with the stops and searches of GA aircraft. Hello everyone, I'm Tom Haynes. Thanks for watching AOPA Live this week. The big announcements in Washington always happen on a Friday. And last Friday, the news was that Janet Napolitano, the Secretary of Homeland Security, was quitting to run the University of California. But she may have actually checked out from DHS a long time ago, along with about a third of the top leadership. Warren Morningstar explains how that may affect you. Homeland Security is the third largest federal agency. Only the Defense Department and Veterans Affairs are bigger, but it's an agency without leaders. AOPA's Craig Spence was a career officer in Homeland Security. So with all the vacant and acting positions at DHS, is this an agency that really has a pilot in command and all the required flight crew? <laughs> Very good point, Warren. Problem as you're talking about, vacancies at the top, create somewhat of a vacuum in that you have, for example, with uh, Secretary Napolitano leaving, the top two positions will be vacant. And then if you look at the other key uh, areas, a lot are served by acting uh, individuals. And that makes it difficult. The rank and file keep doing what they're doing, but there's not really the clear guidance coming down from top. Out of 45 top management positions, 15 are either vacant or filled by acting bosses, usually people who have other jobs too. Uh, generally, in, uh, in the federal government, an acting position is a career federal employee, and um, they just want to make sure that uh, it's smooth sailing until the new boss comes in. And if subordinates start exceeding their authority, will an acting boss rein them in? May not even know what's going on. They're dealing, remember, they're out of an element. They're doing their job and someone else's at that same point in time. And so they, um, the fire hose effect is really, uh, really taking hold. Looking specifically at Customs and Border Protection, the top two positions are acting, and there are a bunch of vacancies as well. Back up in CBP's parent agency, the inspector general position has been vacant for two years. The, the inspector general is, is a key position in any federal agency, and they hold the agency accountable. Um, ultimately, the people hold the agency accountable, but the inspector general is that, uh, that conscience in the back of, of your head. Are you doing what you need to be doing? Are you doing it in a, a cost-effective and efficient manner and within the bounds that you've been given? And if you don't have that guidance, um, then you can have situations that sometimes get out of control. And the privacy officer position is also vacant. Chief privacy officer at DHS is a, a very important position. Um, it and the individual responsible analyzes the rules, policies and procedures that are utilized by the Department of Homeland Security to ensure that the privacy of U.S. citizens is maintained. Um, without that position um, and a strong advocate in that position, you can have the pendulum tending to swing away from the, the protecting the rights and privacy of civilians. Uh, of the citizens of the United States. And more leadership posts will likely empty out. That's what happens in federal agencies during a president's second term. Your next oversight uh, is Congress, and that's where we'll be looking at uh, for our problem with the, the searches. Warren Morningstar, AOPA Live. Thanks, Warren. We tried to talk to Homeland Security. The press office said, send an email. We did, and they haven't answered yet. You may remember the glider pilot who was arrested last year by South Carolina authorities. Robin Fleming spent the night in jail after sheriff deputies in Darlington County accused him of violating a no-fly zone. Fleming was catching a thermal near a nuclear power plant over a lake. The action, AOPA took action for him with local, state, and federal authorities. Robin passed away, I'm sorry to report, earlier this month after a battle with cancer. He was 71 years old. Speaking of places where you really shouldn't fly, our friends at the Interagency Fire Center want to remind pilots there, there are still a lot of wildfires burning out there. That means TFRs around many of them to provide a safe environment for firefighting aircraft. 
And trust me, Boraid bomber pilots can't see you in the smoke and could maneuver around you even if they could. Check your notams. You can see a graphic depiction of TFRs on AOPA FlyQ web. Just click on the flight planning tab. Well, now it's up to the Senate. This week, the House passed the Small Airplane Revitalization Act. That bill directs the FAA to move forward with changes to FAR Part 23 certification standards. The goal, get this, is to double the safety of GA aircraft and cut certification costs in half. Those changes were recommended by an aviation rulemaking committee composed of representatives from all facets of general aviation and spearheaded by the General Aviation Manufacturers Association. AOPA was also on that committee and helped lobby for the bill. And that makes us wonder, will it take an act of Congress to get the FAA to move on the AOPA EAA medical petition? This week in his blog post, AOPA President Craig Fuller asked, why is simple so hard? Craig joins us now from Flight Safety in Wichita, where he's doing recurrent training. And Craig, well, why is it so hard? Well, you know, Tom, it's a real point of frustration, I think, because Working with EAA, uh, we and EAA have come up with something that can save our members well over $200 million over the next 10 years, can save the FAA money, can help keep people flying, which we should all want to do, and yet we just can't get an answer out of the FAA uh, on this whole question of the third-class medical. Uh, and, and, it, and I don't know why, because we've actually patterned the proposal after the sport pilot uh, uh, approach, which has worked well for a decade. So it, it just seems like uh, this is one of those things that would be easy to say yes to. And we've asked the administrator directly, Jack Pelton and I met with him a few months ago. We've asked him directly to review the findings of staff and, and let this go forward. And if not forward for all who might qualify and be able to use it, at least let it go forward on a test basis to see whether there isn't merit to the approach. So, Craig, it, it really does seem so simple. So why is it taking so long? Well, I respect the fact they've got a lot on their plate, but one of their senior people told our staff before we met with Administrator Huerta that this just wasn't a priority for him. And yet, this proposed change, this uh, waiver for the third-class medical, uh, had thousands and thousands of comments that went to the FAA in support of it. So it's a priority for pilots. It may not be a priority for some in the FAA, but again, we patterned the proposal after light, the light sport aircraft approach to the medicals, which allows you to use your driver's license. Uh, we put a feature in there that re- would have an individual actually take uh, a course online that I think really is a much better uh, approach than to just kind of rush through a, a, a medical examination and get that third class medical. So we, we have several components we think would Im- improve safety. We know it will save money. Uh, we hope the FAA will uh, will move forward on this. Mm, okay. Well, thanks, Craig. Kind of un- unbelievable We're handing them a win and they don't seem to want to take it. You can read Craig's blog about the medical certification in action on AOPA.org. Click on the news and video tab and then AOPA now under the videos and blogs category. There's also a link to more information on the AOPA EAA medical petition. The FAA, AOPA, and 10 other associations are working together to put out some medical information you need to know. Common over-the-counter drugs may be a hazard to your flying. So like Excedrin PM, um, Sudafed has has a medication in there called diphenhydramine that can be sedating, and it really has a long uh, half-life and can stay in your system for some time. Research by the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee found that in some of the fatal accidents, that they studied, the pilot had taken medications, prescription and over-the-counter, that might have impaired them in some way. Particularly for over-the-counter meds, the group wanted to give pilots some guidelines. We also wanted to have a rule of thumb of five dosing intervals for medications. So if you take a medication that could have some sedating or impairing effects, you should wait five times the dosing interval. So if the medication says take every four hours, you should wait probably 20 hours before you go fly just to be safe. But what medications can affect you? Well, the FAA won't tell you, but AOPA will. On AOPA.org, you'll find a database of medications and their side effects. We'll also tell you if the FAA permits the use of the med. You can find it at the URL there on your screen. The latest generation of Diamond's DA-42 has a lot of new features. The high-tech bird makes it easy on pilots to get the airplane to just sip fuel, and yes, it's a twin. 
AOPA flight training editor Ian Twombly took the Mark 6 for a flight. Welcome to the future of personal air travel. The future is diesel engines, fuel economy, no nice, high, fast, or maybe even uh, sipping fuel as you go. This is the new Diamond DA42 version 6, or maybe V1, I guess, depending on how you look at Roman numerals. With the Dash 6, Diamond spent about a year making improvements. Mostly it's aerodynamic cleanup. You have the same engines, the same 168 horsepower that you saw, the Austro Mercedes derived engines of the NG. For example, more than 200 screws are now flush instead of having the, uh, the rounded tops. The propellers are brand new. The previous DA42 had what we like to think of as matchstick, um, kind of skinny propellers. These look like real airplane propellers, actually not very different from what we have on our DA40. Of course, these can be feathered besides being constant speed props. Essentially what, what swayed us was the, uh, the two engines. Um, we really want to be able to go to the Bahamas, we want to go to Alaska, we want to really be able to fly over some hospitable uh, terrain where having that second engine is, is, is pretty comforting. And another thing that really attracted me is that the engines are computer controlled. These are literally Mercedes car engines. And Diamond takes those engines, they replace things like the alternator and the turbochargers, but they don't touch the engines themselves. If you're used to flying Lycomings or Continentals, or even Rotex really, the startup and shutdown procedure of these uh, Austro engines is gonna be a little weird, and in a lot of cases, a little boring. It's really just flip on the master. If the engine's cold, you wait for a glow plug indication. Uh, in this case, the engines are a little warm, and then it's turn the key, just like a car. And the shutdown is really just as easy. Um, all our avionics masters and everything are off. It's just a matter of uh, turning off the master. That's all there is to it. And the advantage of FADEC, among other things, is that the computer figures it all out for you. You pick a, uh, really, a fuel burn you want and a speed you want, and it does the rest. Uh, we picked Economy Cruise. We're at 11.5 right now, and uh, that translates to about 155 true and about uh, 10 and a half gallons, a little less, actually. And that's not 10 and a half gallons aside. That's 10 and a half total. Um, and it really is so easy. All you do is set the power. That's climb, cruise, descent everything. It just stays there. There's no Lena Peak, Richa Peak. It does it all. It's very easy to interpret. If you're used to flying a DA-40, the 42 is an easy transition. The 40 is known to be kind of a slippery airplane, hard to come down and slow down, but the 42 is a little easier. You pull the throttles all the way back and you really get a lot of drag from the props. And the other nice thing is that the gear, uh, you can operate it, bring it down all the way to redline. So if you need more drag, put the gear down. Ian Twombly, AOPA Live. Thanks, Ian. Uh, the airplane goes for $940,000, but with its diesel engines, it is about as future-proof as you can get. Read more about it and other diesel technologies in the August issue of AOPA Pilot. Well, coming up after the break, the drone makes it look easy, and how to eyeball a glide slope Rod Machado style. Stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back, you're watching AOPA Live this week. Well, here's something in the no practical use, but it's cool category. A human-powered helicopter has finally won the Sikorsky Prize. 
The American Helicopter Society first offered the prize in 1980 to the first human-powered helicopter that could remain airborne at about 10 feet for 60 seconds and be controllable enough to stay within a 10 by 10 meter square. Aerovelo and the University of Toronto finally did it. The team down the road from us at the University of Maryland came close a couple of times, but no cigar. Well, some say the toughest thing for a new naval aviator is the first solo trap. That's an arrested carrier landing. Last week, the X-47B drone made it look easy on the carrier George H.W. Bush off the coast of the United States. It's a first for the Navy. They're working toward integrating unmanned autonomous aircraft into carrier operations. X-47B drone has anti-collision sensors, but the Navy hasn't said how much about how they work and how effective they are in civilian airspace. And that's critical to AOPA. More agencies and private companies want to put unmanned aircraft into the national airspace system. AOPA will resist that until we're sure they won't run into us. Click on the Advocacy tab on AOPA.org to learn more about that policy. You should also listen to your flight instructor, especially if he's Rod Machado. Last week, we told you about the importance of a stabilized approach. This week, Rod shows us how to find the right glide path with nothing more than the old Mark Eyeball. Hello, folks. I'm Rob Machado for AOPA Live. As pilots, we're fortunate to have several different means of evaluating our glide path to a runway. And I'm thinking of a VASI or even an electronic glide slope in the form of an ILS or GPS advisory glide slope. But there's another basic method of glide path evaluation that pilots sometimes fail to use, and it's called the EYE-BALL method the eyeball method, and it involves assessing the geometric shape of the runway and how that shape varies over time. So let's do a quick review of runway approach geometry. One of the things you learned as a good stick and rudder pilot is that when you turn from base to final and stabilize your approach, you'll see one spot through your windscreen that doesn't appear to move, turbulence notwithstanding. And this spot represents the end point of your glide path's trajectory. Hopefully, this stationary spot is located in the center of the first third of the landing runway. And if not, then you'll modify your glide path to make it so. Now, here's the essential element in using the eyeball method. As you approach the stationary spot on the runway during a stabilized approach, and stabilized is, is extremely important here, the runway's trapezoidal shape will remain the same, but it will grow in size. And that means any part of the runway above your stationary spot will actually move up in your windscreen. And any part below the stationary spot will move down in the windscreen. Now with this information in mind, let's turn final at a slightly higher altitude and assess where our normal glide path takes us. First, take a look at the shape of both the right and left runways. They appear relatively long and trapezoidal. As we approach both runways, their shapes remain essentially the same. Additionally, the one spot that remains stationary in the windscreen on the left runway is the first intersection past the landing threshold, and that's where our glide path is taking us. Okay, now let's turn final approach at a lower altitude and assess where this glide path is taking us. The first thing you should notice is the compressed trapezoidal shape of both runways. And this is one of the first clues that tells you you're low on approach. The runway just doesn't look like it typically does when you're flying a normal glide path. Now, identify the stationary spot on the left runway through your windscreen. Ah, the glide path is taking us to the numbers, isn't it? Unfortunately, those numbers are painted on the roof of that cop car in that parking lot, not the runway. The wisest thing we can do here is to add power and level off until our runway's trapezoidal shape looks more like what we're used to seeing over there. Then we'll recommence our approach when uh, we have a stationary spot that's hopefully located somewhere in the first third of the landing runway. So here's what we've learned. When you turn on to final approach and assess the runway's trapezoidal shape, there should be a reasonable distance between the approach end and the departure end of that runway. If your glide path is taking you to the runway, then one spot on that runway will appear to remain stationary and the runway will, will appear to grow in your windscreen while retaining its same trapezoidal shape. If, however, you turn on to final approach and the ends of that runway are too close together or are coming closer together, 
then it's possible that your glide path is probably lower than normal. And the stationary spot in your windscreen is probably located somewhere short of the runway threshold. So use whatever visual or electronic glide slopes that are available to you, but don't forget to back up what you see with your eyeballs. I'm Rod Machado for AOPA Live. Good info as always from Rod. Be sure to visit Rod Machado's website at rodmachado.com. And that's it for this week. I'm Tom Haynes. Thanks for watching. We'll see you right back here next Thursday. Oh.